Over the last century, British Airways has become one of our most iconic companies. Well, it was a creme de la creme, as my mother would say. <laughs> It launched the world's first international flight service. It was the start of a new era for the whole of aviation, really. The first jetliner. It completely revolutionised air travel. And the first ever supersonic passenger plane. Once you'd flown on Concorde, it was like being a member of an exclusive club. But it has also faced very turbulent times. I knew it was being bombed because I could smell the cordite. You know, we're just ordinary people on a flight. We just thought they'd let us go. Her struggle to keep up with the competition. I don't care what fare you've got. Mine is the cheapest. And been forced to make tough decisions in order to survive. This was not just some nice, cuddly British airline, but this was a world leader. This is the story of a thoroughly British airline and its first 100 years in the sky. Britain in the late 1960s and 70s was an exciting time of youth culture and dynamic technological advances. The hovercraft came into service and we saw man land on the moon. This time of change also saw Britain's aviation industry in transition when a new company emerged from the government-led amalgamation of BOAC and BEA into the modern airline we know now. Formed in 1974, it was a tough start for British Airways as different working cultures and thousands of staff merged. Into these stormy skies came a revolution, Concorde. Concorde was a project born in the 1960s out of a really uh, grand uh, political desire to have a, a major cooperation between the UK and France, something which uh, in these uh, days of Brexit, post-Brexit, you could hardly imagine. 16 of the world's airlines on the threshold of the supersonic age. Customers for the Anglo-French Concorde, the first supersonic airliner in the world. It cost the French and British governments over a billion pounds to develop and build the first four aircraft, so flights were never going to be cheap. You're going to have to be ferociously rich and famous to fly on Concorde. Only a privileged few were allowed behind the security barrier, but at least we can see what she looks like in the flesh. Once you'd flown on Concorde, it was like being a member of an exclusive club. It was always like a badge of honour to have flown on Concorde. Now, up toward the skies, the white bird of tomorrow. My relationship with Concorde started before Concorde went into service. I was doing a promotion, some promotion in the Middle East, and I went to this big party, and there was a pilot from British Aerospace and a pilot from Aerospatiale France. And we were talking about what they were doing, and they were saying, well, actually, what we've done is we've looked for the worst weather in the world, and we're going to take Concorde out tomorrow and put it through its paces so that the whole of the, the aeroplane was computers with, I think, about four seats for people. And I honestly, don't ask me, I don't even know why I said it, but I said, oh, can I come? And they went, well, OK, yes, if you're up at three in the morning and you don't mind a bit of turbulence. And I found myself on the tarmac at three in the morning thinking, why am I doing this? Anyway, I did it and it was an extraordinary experience. Concorde's such a special aircraft. I vividly remember the very first takeoff on Concorde, which is the, the best part, really. You're going down the runway about 200 miles an hour, and you go into V2, and you take off. This is indeed Concorde's day. We took the most travel-sophisticated people in the world on Concorde. Is this to be the image of Concorde man, sipping champagne 10 miles above the earth? There was always a little spark in their eye. There was always that moment of excitement that you see two dawns going to New York. I mean, how can you get bored with that? Approaching the speed of sound, Mach 1. There was actually a speedometer inside the cabin, so there would be that silence. You, know, you would not be serving the main course as it just came up to before Mach 1. And then there would be that little just, it's just like a hiccup. Hoop. There we are. Mac 1, we are now at the speed of sound. And then you were over the sound barrier and then going up to twice the speed of sound because it went at twice the speed of sound. You're literally on the edge of space. Apparently when you get up to that sort of level where the sky goes really dark, NASA actually calls you, you almost become an astronaut. It's 
quite extraordinary, really, isn't it? <laughs> so all those passages that went on Concorde were actually astronauts. <laughs> I think Concorde was such a success in its time because it really pushed the boundaries of engineering. It really captured people's imagination. It was different. There was nothing out there like Concorde and there has been nothing since. We often had people who had saved and saved and saved. And just for that one flight, they would fly out to New York on Concorde and then come back on, on a jumbo. Concorde was above first class, you know. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't first class, it was Concorde class. And it, it was a cut above everything, really. There was no better way to fly. Throughout the 1970s and 80s, that level of luxury continued in BA's subsonic fleet, in business and first class, as the company worked hard to be first choice in high class air travel. Flying was something which was done by the elite. It was sort of expensive, but it was aimed at a luxury market, mostly for business travel. The passengers were made to feel very special. We knew our passengers by name. They were greeted because maybe there were only six or eight first-class passengers. Um, the food was delicious by any, I mean, still, and when you think how old-fashioned the ovens were in those days. We had a, a choice of uh, something like you know, the best steak or, or, or grouse or pheasant or something like that, wonderful wines and desserts. I mean, it doesn't compare with buying a sandwich on board on a, a low-cost airline today, that's for sure. The stewards and stewardesses would be serving silver service almost at the seats on the plane. There is this idea that if you're prepared to spend, we are going to give you a great, great treat. And my goodness, people are very well looked after, as well they might be the amount that they're paying. BA dazzled the public with Concorde, but the company was struggling financially. It saw a large drop in passenger numbers due to the global economic recession. It needed a bold new idea to maintain its dominance on the world stage. In the 1970s and 80s, British Airways was struggling financially soaring costs due to increasing oil prices, as well as a worldwide recession, hit passenger numbers and profits hard. As a government-owned company, it was left to the taxpayer to keep it flying. BA needed an exciting and innovative way of building passenger numbers. So they launched a revolutionary new service, Europe's first walk-on, no-reservation, pay-on-board flight, the shuttle. At Heathrow, a British Airways Triton starts a new popular service to the north. The 1st of February, 1975. It was a revolutionary day. You've decided in a hurry to make a trip to Glasgow and back? No problem. Just walk in, buy your ticket and go. It's as simple as that. It's going to be quite expensive. £26 one way, I seem to recall. So um, a fortune by today's standards. But people loved it. Passengers have the option of paying for their seats through a travel agent or at the airport with cash, cheque or credit card. No need to book, your seat is guaranteed. That means if the scheduled plane is full, another will be provided immediately. Never before had air travel been so accessible. Passengers were put on a backup plane if the first was full. Not only one aircraft, but it could be maybe even five or six backup aircraft. It's hard to believe today because airlines don't just have aircraft sloshing around, nor are the slots available to fly them. First flighters receive a memento of the occasion. In fact, it became like a bus service. It's quite remarkable. They had a, a, the steward would come round and take your money and give you a ticket, you know. It's like, you know, on the buses, really. It was quite, quite extraordinary, really. You could fly to Manchester in half an hour. You could get up to Glasgow or Edinburgh or Aberdeen in 45 minutes, maybe an hour. And uh, a lot of business people took the advantage of that. The shuttle is what you put into it. The shuttle flew for nearly 20 years, but eventually the company couldn't make the numbers work. It just wasn't cost effective for BA to run so many backup planes and the service ended. One thing the airline could rely on, though, was its army of cabin crew. Ross Hanby joined their ranks in the 1970s. We had a 10-year contract or 
36 years old, whichever came first. And we were not allowed to fly past that age because we were no longer considered air hostess material. Or we were not considered to look like air hostess material. We were hauled in if we got too fat. We weren't allowed to get married. But in fact, some air hostess did get married and then they wore their wedding and they'd wear it on a chain round their neck. And we were told when we sat down that you had to keep your knees together and your, your, your legs over slightly to one side. And when you look at the air hostess photographs from that era, all the little legs were all going in that, or that direction. Cabin crew were expected to look the part and glamour was essential. We would like to present a new uniform designed especially for you it will be worn by all British Airways female cabin crew and uniformed ground staff. You're measured up for your uniform and you just feel like the bee's knees. And I was beside myself. Top stitching is featured and the dress can be worn with or without a belt. Like the dress, the blouse is woven polyester, which not only looks but feels like silk. I remember, it's embarrassing to admit now, that I actually got on a bus. I wasn't going anywhere special, I just had to get on a bus and show everyone. I had to show off my new uniform. Although the coat is showerproof, something else is needed for those sudden downpours that can occur in Singapore or Manchester. So there's a dark blue, cotton-backed, shiny PVC raincoat. We started in the economy as rookies. There were three stewards and three stewardesses. Uh, and they were called A Lady, B Lady and C Lady. The A Lady was in first class and B and C were in economy. Um, so you graduated to being an A Lady and you went back to the school to do a little, learn a few refinements. I imagine it's very important to know one's individual role and the role of one's colleagues in order to achieve the continuity of service. I mean, in many ways, it sounds rather strange and old fashioned, but in many ways being an air hostess was like a finishing school for a lot of quite posh ladies. As well as carrying passengers, airline travel also carried with it a risk. In the fast-moving world of jet travel, accidents could and did tragically happen. British Airways is proud of its safety record, but in 1976, it would be dealt a devastating blow. On the 10th of September, a British Airways flight with 63 passengers and crew on board left London bound for Istanbul when tragedy struck. As it entered what was then Yugoslavian airspace, the BA plane collided with another aircraft, killing all 176 people on board the jets. The subsequent investigation ruled that it was the fault of the Zagreb air traffic controllers who had failed to follow procedure correctly. Valuable safety lessons were learned in the wake of the collision, and new guidelines were rolled out across the aviation industry. By the mid-1970s, BA had the largest route network in the world, flying to 149 cities, and the company basically had a monopoly over long-haul travel in the UK. But its cosy world was rattled, when a new airline took to the transatlantic skies in 1977, owned by flamboyant businessman Freddie Laker, who had a radical strategy. I don't care what fare you've got, mine is the cheapest. Freddie Laker really was uh, someone who was able to play on his personality. You know, he'd been a pilot himself, he was uh, uh, an absolute aviation enthusiast, and he saw the chance to come in and uh, shake up the status quo. <laughs> you want me to <laughs> he was able to say, I'm going to offer you a cheap fare, uh, exciting, sexy sounding airline, Skytrain, on a brand new DC 10 aircraft. He'd be there with photos of him standing in front of his DC 10 plane with his name emblazoned across uh, the engine on the tail. Freddie Laker saw himself as David to BA's Goliath and wanted to democratise air travel, which he viewed as being far too elitist. He saw that there was a need for a budget, no-frills airline, where people just buy the ticket and get on. He was opening up a new market for travel. With Laker's Skytrain fares roughly half those of British Airways, people couldn't get enough of these cheap seats, even queuing for days for a standby ticket. Laker Airlines were actually turning customers away. Laker is, for the moment at least, still the cheapest airline across the Atlantic. And while the others are fighting to fill seats, 
Lakers cheap fares have meant fully booked planes to the States for at least the next five days. I, I mean, I can remember planes being absolutely, absolutely chock-a-block full and, and, and fares going right down. And I think it gave everyone a fright. I'm very pleased with Lakers, at least what he's done in the States as far as uh, bringing the price of flights down. I think it was a time when People wanted to travel and they didn't feel that it was just only for the exclusive few, but that actually everyone had the right to travel the world and you didn't have to be a member of the exclusive club. Freddie Laker overnight became a champion of the people because he had personally democratised air travel across the Atlantic. But Laker's price strategy was struggling to cover his airline's costs. The Skytrain was about to hit turbulence. Just three words told British readers the bad news. Freddie Laker had pushed ahead with his expansion plans, buying more new aircraft, and all of it on credit. Finally, the bubble burst when the bank said, enough is enough. Even though Skytrain was going for less than five years, it let the genie out of the bottle. And so Laker Skytrain collapsed in 1982. But by then, the established airlines, like British Airways, had realised, oh, I'll tell you what, if we cut fares, more people fly, and we might actually make a bit more money. In spite of Laker's collapse, he helped to reduce passenger fares across the whole of the industry and allowed a low-cost revolution to continue. By 1981, British Airways was considered a failing company, making staggering losses of almost £300,000 every day and gaining a reputation for poor customer service. Bosses decided that they needed to reconnect with their passengers, and crew member Roz Hanby was chosen to be the new welcoming face of the airline. They were looking for a, a, an image, a new image for the airline. They did like these massive interviews, I think it was about 1,500 people. Eventually there were three of us and I was lucky enough to be chosen. <laughs> we had a professor on board today who was wrestling with an enormous problem. He got the answer in the end, though. I can still remember exactly where I was standing when I got the telephone call saying it's you. Some British Airways passengers seem to need more looking after than others. As far as they were concerned, that was an experiment because I wasn't a professional actress, I wasn't a model. So they were basing an advertising campaign around somebody who was an unknown quantity, really. I was flying, I was doing my day job, um, and then I was doing some of the advertising as well, and this just grew and grew. I think I ended up doing about 20 commercials. Okay. We've got a little problem. But there was just something extraordinarily privileged about that period and that time, that you had been chosen to do something very special. Unfortunately for BA, the campaign did little to reverse the company's losses. And by 1982, publicly funded BA was still hemorrhaging £300 million a year of taxpayers' money. In an effort to pull out of the financial nosedive, then Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher decided to bring in John King and Colin Marshall to head it up with a view to privatising the troubled airline. Advertising company Saatchi & Saatchi were chosen to revitalise its image. It was going through an extraordinary revolution as a company. Lord King and Colin Marshall had come in, uh, and obviously with a brief from Margaret Thatcher to get it into a state to privatise it. It was slow, it was bureaucratic, customer service wasn't great, um, employee morale was poor, um, occasionally people called it bloody awful as opposed to British Airways, um, so it wasn't in a great place. We set about deliberately sort of starting something completely new. BA wanted something spectacular and groundbreaking. We didn't show any aeroplanes, we didn't show any passengers or staff or anything like that. We talked about the entire population of Manhattan flying to London and um, so it was a big statistic. Every year more people choose to fly with British Airways to more countries than with any other airline. Leaving 2,000 feet on the glide path. In fact, every year we bring more people across the Atlantic than the entire population of Manhattan. The very beauty of it was that it didn't feel like an airline advert 
And it had a number of roles. I mean, first and foremost, it was to signal a new era of getting people to think entirely differently, that this was not just some nice, cuddly British airline. The advert stated the company's place as a huge global brand. And with this exciting new image, the government decided that BA was ready to be privatised. Well, Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s was very much on this big campaign of privatisations and uh, uh, having the belief that uh, different sectors would benefit far more from uh, companies being run as private, uh, commercially driven entities. Between them, King and Marshall set about a process of cost-cutting and streamlining, and while painful, it was effective, and soon BA was turning a profit. Many people would have argued it was uh, allowed to be privatised with, with, as it were, a silver spoon in its mouth, certain debts were written off. The management who oversaw uh, privatisation saw the opportunity to move British Airways away from this, this reputation for being bloody awful to becoming the world's favourite airline. So the airline became more profitable and ready for privatisation. People wasn't quite sure what the share price would be. We just had British Telecom just floated privately. We had uh, British Gas as well, Rolls-Royce. So British Airways was another big player and everyone was thinking well, how, how much would be the share price. At the stock market when it opened up the following day, I, the, I, the shares went very, very well. I mean, there was a big take for the shares and they soon went up. BA was a very profitable business and it was seen because of that profitability as one of the more successful uh, privatisations at the time. All of a sudden British Airways was in the top five of all the other airlines which was phenomenal really. With profits and planes soaring, BA had weathered the storm of the 1980s. But as the new decade dawned, new challenges were just around the corner, both in the boardroom and on the battlefield. Since World War II, British Airways had been owned and run by the state. But in 1987, the Thatcher government floated the company on the stock exchange. Now they were responsible to shareholders, the management of the airline were determined to keep it ahead of the competition in the skies. To do this, they once again turned to the ad industry. British Airways was privatised in 1987. And of course, pre-privatisation, it was one of those nationalised industries which didn't have the reputation that it wanted or could have. So we set about deliberately sort of starting something completely new. The face commercial was, uh, I think it, it was another big sort of um, significant punctuation mark in the sort of BA marketing uh, development. Now a private company, BA set its stall out with arguably the most expensive advertising campaign of its time, creating the Face commercial. It was 1989 and the airline wanted to project a powerful message that they were big players on the world stage. It wasn't a difficult sell to BA because BA by then uh, were part of our culture. But it's also fair to say that when I gave them the production budget, which I think was the first million pound commercial, the sell got a little bit tougher. The idea came from the fact that people fly to be with other people. And they don't fly because they want to sit in an aeroplane in a, in a seat for 10 hours or whatever it is they're going on and to eat an airline meal. They're really flying to be with someone else, so that was very important. Every year, the world's favourite airline brings 24 million people together. Everything had to be bigger and better and more prestigious and more affecting on the customer. But certainly under the sort of King Marshall era, um, everything had to be the best. And if that meant investing money that the consumer would notice and would get the right consumer response, then they'd go ahead and do it. This newfound confidence and optimism was mirrored across the airline industry, with new airlines springing up to challenge the dominance of the established carriers. Richard Branson had started Virgin in 1984, operating with a single aircraft out of Gatwick. But it wasn't until new routes were opened up for Virgin Atlantic at Heathrow that the battle really began. The rivalry between uh, British Airways and Virgin uh, was and 
in some ways still is quite personal. British Airways has an absolutely gold-plated advantage over every other airline in the world. It's got the majority of slots at Heathrow Airport. But before long, the airline was being accused of abusing their advantage. Well, the, the, the allegations that were made by Virgin were that you know, uh, there was deliberate action by uh, British Airways in terms of undercutting and pricing, trying to poach passengers. Virgin Atlantic's bookings were done through a BA computer. Guess what? Apparently, they were tapping into it, they were getting the customer's details, they were phoning them up. They were pretending to be from Virgin Atlantic saying, uh, your flight's gone technical. Oh no, oh no, let's book you on British Airways. I'll tell you what, we'll even give you an upgrade to first. We've tried to ask for an apology. Uh, we've tried to ask for clear assurances that it won't go on in the future. Sadly, we decided that uh, we need to let um, the authorities decide who's right and who's wrong. Virgin got wind of this, went to court, and it cost millions of pounds, and of course, didn't make British Airways look at all good. Obviously delighted with today's result, and hope that it will bring in a new era of fair competition in British aviation history in the future. It must have been quite a humiliating climb down for British Airways when it was forced to, to hand over millions of pounds to Virgin Atlantic. This is a, an airline which has always said, oh, we love competition. Um, didn't look as though it was doing that much loving of competition at the time when they were um, indulging what later became known as dirty tricks. As it fought a PR war in the wake of the Dirty Trick scandal, another conflict was brewing thousands of miles away from Heathrow. In the sands of the Middle East, Saddam Hussein, the ruler of Iraq, ordered the invasion of neighboring Kuwait. Unbeknownst to British Airways and the passengers of flight BA-149, they were about to find themselves in the heat of battle, and the world was watching. When we'd landed in Kuwait uh, for the refueling stop, and it was the, the cleaning staff that sort of first put us on a bit of a something, some, you know, that kind of feeling you can't quite put your finger on it. Next thing was the plane shook. Something was very wrong. Fast jets came over and we heard uh, the bombs exploding. The staff were, get off the plane, leave your bags immediately leave the plane and to the, go into the terminal. I knew it was being bombed because I could smell the cordite. The crew were still, they, they were still taking, you know, their responsibilities ser seriously. They were still trying to organise things for the, for the benefit of everybody. Although they were safely off the plane, everyone on board the flight was taken hostage and then transported to different locations in Kuwait and Iraq and became part of the infamous Human Shield. This camp, it was called IBI camp, and right next door to the camp was an enormous uh, petrochemical installation. It had been um, all wired up and you could see big parcels of uh, explosives all over the whole of the installation. We'd been in the camp about uh, 10 days maybe, and Saddam had said that he was releasing families. So we were quite jubilant at that. So we got bits packed up um, when we went out to um, board the coaches. They then said the men couldn't go. Uh, I don't really want to leave them. Many children were too young to understand the impact of separation. Others knew only too well that for as long as there is a threat of war, their fathers will be forced to stay. I did not want to leave my dad, did not want to leave my dad. I'm sure my mum didn't want to leave him either. That was one of the worst bits, leaving, leaving John, because I didn't know when I'd ever see him again, if I'd see him again. So we, uh, we just had to go. British Embassy has just confirmed that the convoy from Kuwait has now reached Baghdad and that the seven coach loads of women and children are safe. We ended up at Baghdad Airport. There was a lot of international media I remember my brother and I, we went round, we split up and we went round every single camera and we were basically just jumping up in the camera. Hi, we're here, we're coming home, they're saying we're coming home because we didn't know what we'd get through to over here, so we just wanted to... We 
we just wanted to try and make sure we got on as many cameras as possible so that the family at home knew we were coming. John Chappell, his fellow male passengers and the rest of the British Airways crew were released in early December after nearly three months of captivity. The BA crew just, they just seemed to be professional. There really did seem to be a sense that they didn't feel they discharged their duty until every one of the passengers was out of their safe, back where they should be. That was part of why people flew British Airways, because you knew you could rely on a British Airways crew to be unflappable under pressure. Okay, stand by for takeoff. This sense of calm and control was a vital attribute on the flight deck which until the mid-1980s was still regarded as a man's world. But as the decade rolled on, airlines saw more women confronting the status quo and taking the controls. Lynn Barton joined British Airways as a pilot in 1987. When I joined British Airways, I was a first officer on the older jumbo, which we called the classic, um, for five years and then the opportunity they introduced the 747-400 and I was a first officer on that for four years and each year there is a process where they open up the bidding and you bid for the commands you want uh, to become a captain um, and it's as captains retire and vacancies or expansion and um, I after nine years, I got my first command, which was on the mixed fleet of the Boeing 757 and 767. Lynn became the first British Airways female captain in 1996 and has always kept a sense of humour about her being a woman driver. We used in those days come out of the flight deck to say goodbye to passengers as they were getting off. And I was saying goodbye and uh, this large gentleman made some a little bit disparaging remark about having had a female pilot drive him to the destination. And behind him was his uh, much shorter, fearsome wife, who gave him an ear bashing all the way off the aircraft. He put up with a few remarks, funny remarks, and it doesn't go beyond that, really, so it's not too bad. What kind of remarks? Oh, well, the sort of thing, that it's all very nice, but really women should be staying in the kitchen and. Not, you know, not trying to interfere sort of thing. It was a completely different time, but of course being brought up in that time, I didn't really perceive it as a handicap, if you see what I mean. I just, I just, I never thought I would become a commercial pilot because nobody in the world, if there was one female commercial pilot, but I didn't think that would be for me. Um, I just thought that, uh, oh, the world was changing and I could have a job working in a flying school. Once I was qualified, being a girl has been a bonus all along the way, I've found, generally. I've had make people make remarks, but, uh, you know, I, I can handle that. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it isn't a real problem, you know. There are more females flying the globe than ever before. BA currently has 280 women pilots, but the industry is always looking to encourage more. British Airways hasn't been afraid to move with the times with regards to its image, either. In 1997, the airline made a bold move to drop its traditional tail fin design and reflect cultures from around the world. Project Utopia 1997 was a way of that British Airways wanted to position themselves in the market as a global brand. I loved Project Utopia. This was a reflection that at the time British Airways was flying about 60% foreign people. The idea of changing away from the, the Union Jack logo on British Airways tails fins was that of Bob Ayling, the CEO of the time. He felt that as a global airline, BA should really reflect its global nature of operations and really show something of a taste of the, the, the multicultural operation that it, that it had. I understood the reason to wanting to be a global brand and having artwork from all around the world, but it was a difficult time because every British Airways employee wants to look out and see their aeroplane and be proud. No, I fly for British Airways. It was very unusual because we, I was so used to seeing the Union Jack on the town, then all of a sudden we got all these different arrangements of artwork, all these ethnic towns from around the world, from different artists. 
I think having that multicultural marketing is a brilliant idea. It was lovely, but it didn't actually fit the mood. Of course, derided in the popular press. I think apart from the identification issue, if it had come along maybe a decade later, people would have thought, yes, of course we're going to embrace the world. This is a marvellous thing to do. I know the former Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, didn't like it at all. I think she said, we fly the flag, not these awful things, and covered up a model that she had with, with, with a, a tissue. We were very patriotic, and we, we felt that the British Airways was part of, you know, the UK, you know, Great Britain, and, uh, you know, we didn't want to lose that identity, basically. The British press and public didn't want the contemporary artwork, and they demanded the flag back. So BA reversed the decision. British Airways has never been funky. It has not. It shouldn't try. It's like your dad trying to dance. It doesn't work. Despite this hiccup, the future was bright for British Airways. As the new millennium dawned, the airline was looking forward to life in its new home, a brand new terminal at Heathrow. That was until the company and the aviation industry was rocked by news from Paris. Aggressive rivalry and competition towards BA increased during the 1990s as it felt the looming threat from the Orange and Emerald armies, which ramped up the pressure with their no-frills approach. During the 1990s, we really began to see uh, in Europe the first development uh, of uh, low-cost airlines. Uh, Ryanair had changed its spots to become the airline that we know today. EasyJet was subsequently born. And British Airways, although they saw that most of that activity was happening uh, in London over at Stansted Airport, they became concerned that uh, this could steal some of their short haul business. When EasyJet got going in 1995, everybody, including me, thought, oh, well, we'll give it a couple of weeks. Um, we've had lots of startup airlines before. Why would one with planes painted orange with the phone number in Luton that you're supposed to phone up to book your flight on them uh, be any different? In retaliation, BA launched its own low-cost carrier in 1998, Go. They ran it separately in order to shake off some of the high costs associated with the legacy of their long history. I think the advantage that some of the low-cost carriers had when they started up was that they were brand new, so they could start everything from scratch, which makes it easier to build up a low-cost base. Whereas British Airways is a legacy carrier, it's got legacy systems, it's it's got a lot more that it has to do to reduce its costs. Go as a low-cost airline was starting to use the elements, the building blocks which uh, were becoming available with the rise of the internet. The service on board, uh, again, was different. Uh, in some ways there was a reflection back to the shuttle idea, but there was no uh, complementary service on board. In the airline industry they call it unbundling, so you take the food, you sell that separately rather than including it in the ticket price. If you want to bring a bag, a checker bag into the hold, you have to pay extra for that. I feel that the low-cost carriers broke it down into to a menu of, well, you've got your ticket, but what else do you want with it? Do you want to take your luggage? Do you want to buy food? Do you want to buy drinks, etc.? And the short haul uh, market really changed by splitting that out and giving consumers that choice. The idea of legacy airlines like BA, Air France, Lufthansa and so on, setting up a budget subsidiary has always been littered with failure. And Go potentially was going to be the same, except clearly the money that uh, Go was eventually sold for shows that actually as a standalone it was a huge success. Go was eventually bought by EasyJet in 2002. The low-cost carrier paid almost £380 million for their rival. Despite profits and passenger numbers being squeezed by low-cost airlines and transatlantic rivals, BA could always fall back on its Trump card. All the other airlines you know, had their 747s and their 75s, but British Airways had Concorde. They had the jewel in the crown. But that was to change when the aviation industry as a whole suffered a catastrophic blow in the year 2000 when an Air France Concorde crashed shortly after takeoff. 
The tragic crash of the, the Air France Concorde uh, was a shock and that did lead to a, a temporary uh, grounding. What really put an end to its uh, operation was uh, the aftermath of the 9-11 terror attacks because Concorde really relied on the New York route on quite a small number of regular travellers. Maybe people were travelling perhaps once a week, even twice a week. 40, 50 people perhaps, but multiplied up over a year, they were making a lot of journeys on the aircraft. And a large number of these people were actually killed in the Twin Towers attack. Declining passenger numbers and escalating maintenance costs left BA with no choice. On the 23rd of October, 2003, Concorde was withdrawn from service. In stark contrast to the preceding months, its final flights were a complete sellout. It was a natural saying goodbye to it and there were fewer and fewer flights. There was thousands of people that turned out at Heathrow to see it, you know, the, the final three uh, aircraft come in to land. And there was people crying, it was very sad. I mean, the, the cabin crew were crying when they came off, you know. And it was just very emotional. 40. 30, 20, begin to check back, 10, and a beautiful touchdown. Absolutely stunning sight. The site of that famous final landing has been BA's home for decades, and Heathrow Airport has constantly faced challenges in its long history. It has always struggled to keep up with vastly increasing passenger numbers and their demands for more amenities. It's always been messy uh, because it's always just been kind of, oh, let's build another bit on, oh, another bit on, let's put Terminal 4 over there. It's not very good because it's the wrong side of an active runway, but we've got to do it there because we can't do it there yet because of planning problems. So it's a complete mess. The solution was Terminal 5. It took 20 years to complete and opened in 2008. Designed to handle 35 million passengers a year, it became the new home of British Airways. Well, an airline like British Airways, you're talking about a, a fleet that runs into hundreds of aircraft. You're talking about more than half the flights in and out of Heathrow every day are operated by British Airways aircraft. That's a massive logistical piece of choreography. Everything was coming together in this 4.3 billion creation, the biggest engineering project, I think, in Western Europe at the time. Um, and it lasted, I think, ooh, half an hour before things started to go horribly, horribly wrong. The baggage system all snarled up. Staff couldn't get into the car parks in order to get to work. Um, it really was one of those most ignominious events. British Airways needed Terminal 5 because this is it, its main base. Um, it needed this brand new piece of modern, technologically advanced architecture. It needed a jewel in its crown um, to be able to compete with what passengers have become used to when they travel to airports in other parts of the world. You can see out, you can see both runways, you can actually see real aeroplanes taxiing in and out and planes taking off and landing, which I love. After an initial bumpy ride, British Airways' new home at Heathrow ironed out the teething problems to become one of the most renowned and efficient facilities of modern aviation. I think for a company like British Airways with its, its long and rich history to look towards the future, I think they've, they've had to go through the changes that they've gone through. They've had to constantly reinvent themselves. They've had to make changes to compete with a very fast changing scene, lots more competition. I think that in the future, people will perhaps value the idea of a flag carrying airline more because uh, although we do have more people traveling on budget airlines, sometimes people want to feel special. As the landscape of air passenger travel continues to develop, our national flag carrier has come a long way from its humble beginnings in a muddy field to being one of the world's most recognizable brands as it heads into the exciting but challenging skies of modern day aviation.